how much would you say the entire value of your cars in your collection how much is it worth around the around the 10 million pound mark and i've got about 1.5 million pounds of the cars being delivered in the next three months we've got the bugatti chiron at 3 million four rolls royce cullinan's at let's say 350 grand a pop by um you know 2025 i want to have doubled the value of my fleet, uh, maybe even more. This week on the Stephen Sully Study podcast, a guy called Lord Aleem. He's the founder of a brand and a company called Platinum Executive Travel. He's got millions of pounds worth of cars, ranging from Lamborghinis, Ferraris, Bugattis, Mercedes, etc. He's also got a massive following on YouTube. He's got a very, very large following on Instagram, over 600,000 followers, and he's verified. I'm really looking forward to hearing about his story because he's also an entrepreneur that has his fingers in different pies, and he's someone that's got a bundle amount of energy. Be happy and never content. Oh, what's going on, mate? How are you, sir? Very good. You all right? Stephen, nice good. to meet you. Yeah, Lee, you my brother. I've been doing a little bit of search upon yourself as okay. well. I've been getting to know what you're all about. All right, cool. You're very successful in your own right. So all right, yeah. Nice to have a chat. Cool, mate. How's it going? Cool. Everyone doing? I was good. just doing a little intro. No, it's wicked, wicked, wicked. All my cars have the, the pet registration. The pet stands for Platinum Executive Travel. travel yeah. And uh, this one is the, the same color combination. It's lovely. As my Bugatti. So this is one of the only few cars I've never actually been in or... Maybe uh, you can go for a spin a little bit yeah, later on. Yeah, that'd be yeah. perfect. It's, yeah, it's, uh, it's the pinnacle of luxury. It's like a magic carpet. If Aladdin was still around now, this is what he'll be rolling around <laughs> in. <laughs> Wicked, bro. Guy. All right, we'll go inside to the, uh, to the studio. Okay. Right, welcome back to my podcast, Steve and Sully Study. As everybody knows, my journey is to interview go-getters, entrepreneurs, athletes, people of music. Next guest in front of me, Mr. Lord Aleem, someone I've been following for a long time. Before we have a discussion, let me just explain and emphasize how much I really admire this guy. Um, he put out a post on his social media, on his Instagram. Bear in mind, he's got a lot of followers. He's verified, got over 600,000 people following in, him on there. And he said, look, I'm going to jump onto three podcasts. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to voice note this guy and I'm going to give him a mini pitch and say why he should come on, on my podcast. And he replied immediately, he sent me his number and here he is. And do you know what? It's not a lot of people in the world, I would say, Aleem, that would probably get back to someone like myself. Um, you know, I'm looking to scale up my podcast and part of doing that is having great conversations with great people. And, you know, you know, I think a lot of people might have felt a bit intimidated to uh, message someone with a big following. So thank you very much for getting back to me. Thank you very much for agreeing to come on the podcast. And thank you very much for your time, brother. It's an absolute honor. Thank you so much, Stephen, for having me here. First and foremost, an absolute beautiful studio that you have here in Soho, London, the capital city, my favorite city. And uh, been welcomed with open arms. And, you know, at the end of the day, I just wanted to do a podcast with someone that I, I feel has value up here, you know, as well. So I, I think you're just the man for that. Top man. So <laughs> how do I, should I introduce you? I mean, look, uh, naturally people would say you're a vlogger, YouTuber, you're also a, an entrepreneur. I know you have uh, Platinum Executive Travel, which mm. is a very, very successful brand. And I've seen firsthand since about, I think it must have been about since 2011, 12, when I started using Instagram, your brand has absolutely exploded personally, but also with your with with your company over the years. Yeah. And look, I'm going to touch on a couple of things where you've gone through challenges, yes, um, perceived challenges anyway. I want to know how you dealt with that because part of being a success, part of being a champion, which you are, is getting through those tough times. But also, you know, what you focus on now and other kind of irons in the fire per se. Yeah? Yes. So. Let me just list some of the cars. I'm a big car fan. <laughs> I've owned the likes of, you know, Ferraris, Porsches, Lamborghinis, Bentleys, thankfully. Right now I'm carless and I've been carless for some time because I'm pumping all my money into my, my property <laughs> project and also into Woodbury House. But then eventually I'm going to get back on that wagon and, and start driving something nice. Definitely. Well, um, when you're in London, it's very difficult to uh, to even enjoy a car. Where do you drive in it? You sit in traffic most of the time. So for efficiency, I guess... Maybe a moped would probably be better. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. So my favorite car out of your whole collection is the Aventador SVJ. Come on. Because partly because of that blinding paint color that you got, which is unique. Thank you. You've obviously got a bunch of different Aventadors and a bunch of different Lamborghinis. You've got Ferraris, Rolls Royces, Bugatti Chiron. I mean, incredible. Mercedes, etc. How much would you say, you must get asked this all the time, the entire 
value of your cars in your collection? How much is it worth? Well, we're living in a climate at the moment where cars are an all-time high. So it's a great question to ask me at a great time. <laughs> um, I would say I would say around the around the ten million pound mark. I mean, I've got about one point five million pounds of the cars being delivered in the next three months. Um, but in, in general, I've never really sat and calculated it, but I would, I'd like to think around the £10 million pound mark. I mean, um, you've got the Bugatti Chiron at three million, four Rolls-Royce Cullinans at, let's say, 350 grand a pop. That's another 1.4 there, so we're already That's on 4.4. That's what you 4. drove down 4. today as That's, well. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, there's, there's some serious, serious value there, uh, but also a, a nice selection of cars for, for our clients and for our long-term um, pet family, shall we say. I like to call them family because once you use us once, you, you always keep coming back for more. It's the service that we provide. But um, but yeah, there, there, there's some value there and I look forward to growing the fleet as well. That's the whole idea, inshallah, by um, you know 2025. I'd want to have doubled the value of my fleet, uh, maybe even more. Who knows? We sometimes aim for a certain level and sometimes we surprise ourselves and, and exceed it. So whatever God wills, that's what we roll with. I've seen you've had a lot of high profile people, celebrities, people that are in the public eye who've who've actually taken on some of your cars. And I think I saw Rolls Royce being hired by Conor McGregor at one stage. Is that right? Yeah, one of my favourite clients. Well, I love Conor McGregor. Um, he's a, he's a he's an absolute superstar. Um, he is one of the reasons why I love UFC. Why I got to start watching UFC. So when I heard, my dad's not very very um on board with like athletes and that sort of stuff he just sees everyone as another client i've got to provide the same job whether you're conor mcgregor or your joe blogs you're going to get the same service and it's always going to be hopefully inshallah 10 out of 10 or 11 out of 10 in our instance but conor mcgregor hired the car it's a funny little story with with conor um conor ended up standing on the car so uh, on the rolls royce wraith um again with my other rolls royce door next to it and it wasn't so much the standing on the car, that's, that's something that, you know, we can overcome. Uh, but because he was such a mega superstar, the number registration boss, 805S, which was a, a very valuable number plate, which we had purchased at the time as part of our collection, a, a number plate that was very dear to us. And because, it, you know, he was such a superstar at the time and it was on the front page of every newspaper, as soon as we slap that number plate onto another car, it would be remembered as the number plate which Conor McGregor stood on. So I had to make a phone call to Conor McGregor. Uh, obviously, I didn't offer him a fight. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, had to, we had to have a little word. And um, it was resolved. And, you know, I, I would, if I was to meet Conor McGregor today, again, I would shake his hand and I, I would say, listen, a fantastic athlete you are. But just please, next time, don't stand on my car because you don't own it. You have hired it. And we, I wouldn't, I mean, back in the days when I was young and, and I was silly, I would take pictures to make pictures go viral standing on cars. But I do find it quite disrespectful. I wouldn't even do it on my own car, even if I owned it. Um, it's the same way of if you was to wear nice clothes and throw purposely throw some Getty Bolognese all over it or, you know, don't give a shit about it. Or if you if you was to have a watch and you was to bash it around everywhere and, and disrespect it to kind of floss how much money you have. I just don't think it's a, a classy way of, um, and it's not a way of, of stunting, shall we say, which is a modern word, that will mature very, very well. But yeah, just to summarize that, um, Conor McGregor, fantastic athlete. Um, he's now on a, an official pet ban, but I don't think he cares. He has his own fleet of cars now, doesn't he? So. <laughs> he, he certainly does. I was going to ask you, so the challenges in your in your business, uh, certainly having very high-end cars, is predominantly you're going to attract, and I'm not being sexist here, I'm just going on, on numbers, and this is my interpretation. Maybe you can, you can correct me. You're going to attract a lot of young alpha type males, you know, who have got a lot of energy, you mm. know, who want to stunt floss look good in front of their peers their family girlfriends mm. etc yeah, business and, meeting make an yeah, impression and and you know certain things you know will escalate you know their excitement turns into sometimes doing silly things you know they might be drinking taking drugs they mm. might be driving too fast mm. and because they are in the aventador the bugatti the the ferrari sometimes they start treating it like they're maybe that they own it for a short amount of time and they might do something silly i mean standing on the car is probably quite mild in comparison to what other people have done so 
do you ever find that that people might take absolute liberties and think you well, know they they've really disrespected the the car? Very good question, there, Stephen. Um, again, uh, our investments are not houses. You know, they're not they're not safe. It's not bricks and mortar. This is an asset that is driving around. Uh, potentially at high speeds it's always you know on the road there's a lot of chances the probability of something happening that's not what we want to happen you know something negative happening to the car or, um, or to the person whatever is you know there is a chance of it there's a, there's a good chance now how do we vet out our clients and how do we minimize this risk well first and foremost um there is a when, when you go through the platinum process of of wanting to inquire to hire a car for self-drive hire we have a chat with you and I believe that, you know, after you've been in the business for so many years and you've met so many different people and you've had so many different discussions, we're a very good judge of character. There's certain questions that we know how to ask, how to ask them if they answered all correctly and, and we get the right vibes off you. It's like ding, ding, ding. Yep. First checklist, is five checklists. First one's good. Second one's good. Good judge of character. But then again, there's some great actors out there as well. Um, so again, you mentioned on the drug side of things, if someone is going to come in smelling of weed or, you know, whatever, then, uh, you know, th there's going to be cause of concern there. There's going to be questions that are asked. Um, again, we can't just judge our clients on that. Otherwise, I'll just have a very small focused market. And here we are trying to appeal to the masses. But then again, we don't want anyone behind our wheel, um, drug driving and, and that sort of stuff. So um, again, we just vet out our clients very, very well. We also have a very extensive, uh, very complicated tracking system. Uh, we have three or four different trackers and one is actually solely just to cut the power off the car. So what we would normally do is we'd give the customer a first warning if we see them exceeding the speed limits or driving harsh or braking harsh. Um, and we'll give them a second warning. By well, the third warning, it is pretty much press the button and the next time that they turn the car off or whatever, the car won't start again and then they will be having to explain themselves on the phone as to why they've done what they've done. Um, now, look, I don't expect you to to completely drive it, you know, at the speed limits and you know, I can't believe I'm saying this on camera, but you've got to have a little bit of fun on it, whether you take it to a racetrack or whatever. So one or two alerts here and there, it's fine. But when you start taking the piss with it, really, then I have to start to think that is the money that you have given me for the hire even worth me giving you my asset like that? So since we have been very, very strict for the last two years, three years um, on our vetting system, on vetting out the clients and making sure that, you know, they are to be trusted with our car, we have hardly had any accidents, brother. Um, we have hardly had any big smashes. And at the end of the day, the client also knows what they're going to get themselves into if that is the case. We, we outline that at the start there's no hidden agenda behind it just look at them stone cold in the eye let them know if you want to drive it like michael schumacher you best believe that you've got michael schumacher's money to pay for it as well yeah you can have all your legals in place before exactly. they set, set Everything off is there. um can you name any um any any big crashes that your clients have had uh yes um uh, well believe it or not i mean do you want to hear the biggest one yeah Definitely. Okay, I don't know how much I can talk about this because it's still ongoing, but I'm just going to go through the skeleton of it. Uh, my Bugatti Chiron uh, was uh, was with a client, um, and it was it was driving down a country lane, and uh, yeah, somebody ended up going into the back of the car. <sighs> Went so, into the so not the client's fault then. Not the client's fault. Um, a Jaguar it wasn't actually even the car's fault that went into the back of us it was a van behind this Jaguar that planted into the back of the van uh, sorry the van's planted into the Jaguar the Jaguar's planted himself back into the Chiron and they believe it or not there was a police car with a dash cam and everything on behind the van that was recording the whole thing and it was just a freak accident and uh, just to put it into perspective for you um, one headlight at the back of the Bugatti Chiron I've got the invoice for it, I paid 49,800 euros for. So pretty much the price of a Mercedes C63 was just a brake light. Um, it's, it, it's crazy. Um, some other accidents that have happened, um, just small little taps here and there, you know, someone's pulled out on someone, um, opened the door, ended up swinging it into a lamppost. Uh, but in terms of big, big accidents, in the, in the last two to three years, not so many, but again, the biggest one was was the Bugatti incident. And it's funny because in the industry that I work in as well, it's as soon as something happens like that, because I've got such a large following, everybody starts to cons starts to create conspiracy theories as to, is it an insurance job? Is it a scam? <laughs> like guys, you know, who on earth would want a car to drive into the back of their Bugatti? Um, 
but it's all fun and games. Um, it's 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 the battle. At least I've gone through the process now of knowing what it's like to repair a Bugatti Chiron. How many people in the world can say that? I am a CEO of a car rental company. I've experienced it all. It makes me more experienced in my industry. It sets me in a position that if I have incidents like this in the future, I just brush them off. You know, I've dealt with it before. It's like a boxer going to fight another champion boxer. You know, like Canelo or whatever. You know, they weathered well. I like to think we've weathered the storm and um, it'll make us stronger. So yeah, there, there is, it's the game that we're in. A boxer gets into the ring, he's expected to get punched. We take our cars, we go off from out on South Drive higher. There is a chance things are gonna go wrong. It's how we bounce back from those, those mistakes and how we can minimize the risk of that actually happening. And uh, Alhamdulillah, I think we've got a good recipe. I think everybody would like to know what our recipe is actually. I like to think that we make the car hire game fun as well, but I'll get onto that in a bit. Great analogy, by the way. Yes. Um, so you've got a bunch of these cars and I think, you know, personally, uh, if I was in your shoes and I had the privilege of, you know, taking some of these beasts out on a regular basis, my biggest problem would be, which one should I take today? So the question is, what is your ultimate favourite car out of the collection? All right, Steve, this is, if I, if, I, if I had a pound for every time I've been asked this question, uh, I, I, would, I would have my second Chiron by now. <laughs> um, it's the car I've pulled up in. It's the Rolls-Royce Culloden. Rolls-Royce has been my favourite brand from day dot. The reason that is because my whole company, my dad started this business off with a Rolls-Royce Phantom. The spirit of ecstasy means so much to me. Um, just Rolls-Royce's ethos means so much to me as well. Strive for perfection, you know. Um, just everything about the brand, the customer service, the way, you know, we have such access to the factory. I've got this one lady out in the factory called Amanda. Who I've got direct contact to. I can discuss any problems with her. It's just the best brand in the world. But now moving on to the <laughs> Rolls-Royce Cullinan, I've always been a big fan of 4x4s, believe it or not. Um, I'm not actually a one of those kind of speed junkies that loves fast cars 24-7. I need some power. I'm now 27 years old. I've gone way past that point now. And um, I'm starting to sound like a granddad. <laughs> but uh, the Rolls-Royce Cullinan, the best car in the world, four-wheel steering, huge car, starlights in the thing, the pinnacle of luxury, the best 4x4 money can buy, maneuvers around central London like a gem. And with my, my setup, I, I believe it's uh, it looks like a sexy car. It definitely, yeah, definitely yeah, does, mate. The Ford Yardos. So Platinum Executive Travel and also being in the luxury car market, why did you choose that name and why did you choose to get into this sector? Okay, um, so in 2006, uh, so before this, my father was a car dealer. He was a car trades trader. He used to buy cars from Birmingham car auctions. Um, so back in the days, the cars used to be running through the auctions, three, four, 500 pound cars, 1,000 pound cars, running through the auction. He'll pick a few out, he'll buy about, He'll started off buying about three or four and then moved on to buying 20 at a time. Buying these cars, doing them up nicely and then running them straight back into the auction. Probably just even takes it for a wash and then runs it back into the auction again. And he's selling it for more of a profit. Obviously, the car game's changed since then. And when the, the car sales game started to fizzle out, especially with the scrappy scheme that came into place where it said, look, you scrap your old car, you get five or ten thousand pounds, something like that off your new car. That caused that forced a lot of people to actually think that, you know what, shall we go for another used car or shall we go and purchase a brand new car? Um, so, yeah, the car sales side of things started to fizzle out towards 2004, 2005. Uh, no, actually, it wasn't 2004, 2005. It was about 2006, 2007. But the market was changing anyway at the time. Um, my dad had some nice cars, uh, like uh, uh, growing up. He's always loved cars. He was a car dealer. He's had Porsches back in the days when he was young. Ferrari 355, 360. One of my favorite cars. Yeah. 355. Incredible. F1 Valenetti. Ah, you know? Incredible. Incredible. <laughs> at, at the time, everybody used to raise an eyebrow over the yeah. flappy paddy gearbox, yeah, yeah. Fl flappy paddle gearbox, especially Jeremy Clarkson used to think everybody was a, a Ponzi, right? Yeah. yeah, driving around with their little gear shifters. But I loved it. I loved it. I love everything. And that that is one of the reasons why I'm here sitting with you with such a passion for cars. It's something that my father instilled in me from from the start he's my idol he's who i look up to and um and you know he's a very inspirational figure and um and and and, and that's how it all kick started off um he used to have a lot of his friends borrowing these cars so he'll be like yo Icky, can i can i borrow your ferrari and he'll be like yeah sweet take it can i borrow your um 355 your 360 and at one point he just thought to himself well, i'm giving my friends the cars all the time you know, what am I doing here? Sitting on my ass doing nothing yeah. right, with it. No, I need to turn it into a business. 
So it always had that in the back of his mind. And then he went to the Dorchester Hotel with my mother for the weekend. And there was a Rolls Royce parked outside the Dorchester Hotel with a registration RR06. D-O-R, which read Rolls-Royce, 06, the year that the car was, and obviously ending with the Dorchester. So he soon this Rolls-Royce outside. He thought, that's nice. I'm going to take my missus to Harrods in that. Went up to the driver. says, go on, mate, give you 100 quid, 50 quid or whatever. Just drop us down to Harrods. The guy laughed in his face. and says, minimum two hours and 200 pound an hour. He just thought, really? <laughs> that's good, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. that's, that sounds good to me. I love cars. It seems like a business idea. So we came back from that weekend and, and basically he said to me, son, we're going to the Rolls Royce dealership and we're buying a Rolls Royce Phantom. And at the time, um, well, I ask my mum and my dad stories about this all the time. My mum tells me your father took a big gamble. You know, that was a lot of money, quarter of a million pound, investing that into a Rolls Royce. It's mega at that time, especially in the position that he was in in, in life as well. But my dad's always been that guy, you know, throws a gamble. He always says you've got to go into business with big balls. Otherwise, you just put them away and um, and and really just you don't do much with it, really. Um, so he's he's gone and he's walked into the Rolls Royce dealership. He's met a fella called John Carts, who's worked for Rolls Royce for 50 plus years. Absolutely fantastic fella. And he goes till this day, he will tell you that he's never met anybody like my father. My father, I remember I was so young. I was in the showroom and he did not get up from that seat in the salesman until he knew he got a deal from the salesman. And John Carts at the time said, I've never sold a Rolls Royce this cheap, brand new to anyone. And he goes, your father is some man. I was young then. I thought, yeah, I know he's some man. He's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so we bought this big boat, right? Rolls Royce Phantom. And when we specced it up, it was a 2006 car. There was a guy who ordered one for the Island Man. It was upstairs sitting there. We said, John, what color should we spec it in? We don't know. He goes, look, there's one round the back. I'll show you that. We've gone and seen that car. It was a flagstone gray car with seashell interior. And my dad's gone, just make it identical to this. And he's looking at my dad thinking, you know, people put a lot of thought into this sort of stuff. He's like, listen, don't worry about it, John. Make it identical to this. I'll be back in six months for my second one. And then we can think harder what spec we want to go for that. And he's looking at my dad thinking, he's just about closed the deal off on the first one. Like, don't worry about the second one. But he had a clear vision of what he wanted to do. He knew the market was there for it. There was no one in Birmingham doing this. He knows that the Asian weddings and all the other types of weddings that are out there. Primarily, I say, I mentioned Asian is because, you know, the, the area that I live in, in Birmingham and I work and operate in is a lot of majority of the people that, that we're around there, uh, especially from where my dad grew up in Allen Rock is all Asian. Mm. It, um, um, so where I live at the moment in Solihull now, it's a little different, but these are the people that we're around. So the he could connect to the Asian wedding scene and the Asian weddings are massive out uh, in the UK. They love to show off and, and, and floss um, on their wedding day as rightly so you should do. It's one of the happiest days of your life. Um, so they like to have a good time. My father wanted to provide them the good time. So this car went out on hire. But what I loved at the time about what my father did with the car was w what I do with the car in terms of marketing. I think my dad actually taught me the marketing side of things of how important marketing is. I remember we did a photo shoot at the time that cost like nearly 20,000 pounds. And these were levels of images that could go up on billboards, that could go up on cinema screens, that could be put on um on, on, on leaflets, on, on all, but the highest of the highest quality, like Rolls Royce level yeah. marketing, right? Got a nice tidy driver as well called Paul Lambert, who was an ex-funeral um, uh, director uh, chap. He used to drive like the, the, the funeral stuff, what are they called, hearses. Yeah. Um, so he was on board, the, the, out, the outfit, everything, the setup was professional. And he started getting customers that were just like, you know, local that were like, yeah, forget the weddings. 1800 pound 2000 pounds show it was 200 pound an hour that was the flat rate take us over to harrods drive us back there was no one doing this there nobody doing this within six months he's ordered his second one six months after that he's ordered the only white rolls royce phantom in the in the country the first official english white rolls royce phantom was ordered by my dad and then the rest is history it just he just got in the work um the company was being noticed by so many people because of the service, the niche service it provides. Now, Rolls Royces, you know, these companies, there's there's quite a lot of them. Yeah. Um, but I like to think, uh, and I'm not just blowing smoke up my own ass or, or my dad's ass, that he was a pioneer in his industry. And he was always a figure that whatever he would do around the area, people that were inspired by him or whatever would copy him. Mm -hmm. He had car washes back in the days, hand car wash. He, he married my mum in 1993. 
And when he went over to Pakistan, uh, my uh, my mom's brothers, my uncles, they've got a, um, a a service station and they do rice distribution and that sort of stuff. He went to one of these service stations and he saw people washing cars with their hands, with a, with like a jet wash kind of thing. Yeah. And he's gone, I'm going to go do this when I get back. And people love the hand car wash service that they provided. So that's how we actually all started off as well. I used to do a bit of hand car washing, a bit of, a, a bit of um, car dealing and that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, he, he's got great business sense. Um, he's very determined in whatever he, what he wants to do. And um, even though I, what, what inspires me and makes me so proud of him as well and, and what's got, kind of got me into this position here now is that he comes from very raw upbringing, a very flat you know, school and that. They didn't really focus on that more. So they were street kids. But he knew the importance of marketing at the time. He knew how important it was that because I'm working with the brand Rolls-Royce, my level of marketing needs to be Rolls Royce quality as well, and nothing less than that. I'm not cutting any corners, and I think that ethos has stayed with us all the way through, and that is why Platinum Executive Travel is considered one of the one of the top companies in this country and and in Europe of the service that we provide, from whether it's delivering the cars, chauffeurs that we provide, getting there on time, never letting you down, physically owning all of our cars, not you know fooling people and lying to people and telling them that they're going to get this car and on the day I'm panicking and I'm broke of the deal to somebody else. If I've got it, you can have it. If I haven't got it, I can direct you to other companies that I, I, I trust and I work alongside with and you can you can try them out. I'm here to assist and, and help people in, in what they want to find and at the end of the day, all good competition is healthy competition and I like to make this car hire game fun. I'd like to think that without myself, this game would be so boring. <laughs> true true stuff there and there's multiple things I'm going to go off of what you just said before I do yes, before sir. I want to go into your you, you know your characteristics and what makes you a successful YouTuber vlogger and also in, in business um, give me an idea of the kind of costs hiring these cars from the Bugatti to maybe the Lamborghini SVJ sure. down to the G-Wagon that you've got for example sure um, so I, I personally think the most value for money car, if I was, if I take myself out of my shoes and, and, and I go into a consumer's perspective, I believe the Mercedes G-Wagon is the most value for money that you're going to get for hiring a car from Platinum Executive Travel. The reason for that is gone are the days now where a G-Wagon can't compete with an Urus or a Cullinan. If you've got a G-Wagon, if you've got a Lamborghini Urus or if yeah. you've got a Rolls-Royce Cullinan, they're all hot cars. And the price difference, which I'll get on to now, of what you pay for a Cullinan for a weekend compared to what you pay for a G-Wagon, is, is there's a considerable difference between them. But I get, a same bu I get the same buzz out of all the cars. And I'm telling you, if any of my clients and customers are watching this, I will tell you this from God's own show, I will always, because I know that they will come back again for more, is set them off on, on, on the Mercedes G-Wagon. So the Mercedes G-Wagon for, let's say, should we just say weekend prices, Friday, yeah. to, Friday to Monday? Friday to Monday, delivery anywhere in the UK included, something like a Mercedes G wagon would be around the 2200 to 2500 pound mark depending on what time of the month it is it used to be a lot cheaper back in the days when the g wagons were priced at 120000 pounds brand new but as you know there's a two and a half year waiting list on a mercedes g wagon um you know, you can buy them for £170,000 brand new from the dealership. But as soon as you drive it out of the showroom, it's already a £220,000 car. Mm. Um, so again, you know, you have to price up accordingly. Um, that's what the G-Wagon prices are. The Rolls-Royce Cullinan, right, on the other hand, the most expensive 4x4 is around £1,800 to £2,000 a day. Um, so, you know, for the weekend, it could cost you anywhere around between the 5,000 to 6,000 pound mark, depending on how much, bearing in mind our company, one thing you will understand with our company is we are not tight with our mileage. You know, when some companies will give you a car for let's say a Rolls Royce Cullinan for 4,000 pound for the weekend, but we'll only give you 300 miles. Here at Platinum, we want you to enjoy yourself, you know, and, and it's not like we want you to take the piss with it, but we want you to enjoy yourself. If you come back with an extra 50 miles, 60 miles on the clock, look, listen, if I really like you, 100, right? I'm not, it's just, it's just an engine, hmm. you know, it's just an engine. It's yeah. a tool to me. I'm not looking to ever resell these cars ever again. So as long as you're happy fella, you're going to be coming back to me. I provide you a top service. So go and enjoy that car. You've paid a lot of money for it. And with the fuel prices now anyway, I don't think people want to be doing a lot of miles. So <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the most expensive. Then we can go on to the Lamborghini Aventador SVJ. That is also a five and a half, six, six thousand pound car um, a weekend. Um, so how we normally price it is it's just the value of the car. 
Uh, so like the SVJs, are, I paid £450,000 for that. It's one of the highest spec coupe ad persona Beautiful cars. Car. The colour, named after my mother as well. Um, uh, the Rolls-Royce Cullinans. Uh, so we've got the Bugatti Chiron as well. So the Bugatti Chiron being the most expensive car on our fleet uh, at self-drive price, it's £25,000 a day. There's a company in Dubai. I, I'm actually launching Pet Dubai soon, but there's a company in Dubai that have also purchased a Chiron last week. And I just phoned them up and inquired how much it was to hire the car. They said 150,000 dirhams, which was £31,000. So... <clears throat> I'm actually cheap, cheaper than them at the moment. So uh, how much is yours, did you say? £25,000 a day. For, for, for the day? For the day, yes. But then again, you know, if um, if I like you and, and we do a, a good bit of background checks on you and, and when, you, when we know you're good for it, we can always come to some sort of deal. You know, I, I've done some uh, promotional deals for, for people. In fact, when the car first arrived, the Bugatti Chiron, when it first arrived, two days after, 48 hours after I took delivery of it, it was hired out to a... Uh, banking company, uh, so they've, they've a fintech company. Sorry, should I say? They contacted me and they said, "Look, we want we want to do a, a, a marketing campaign, and we know that you are very talented in your in your field." Which I was quite honoured by hearing. Actually, I thought, you know what? Um, if they if they're going to give me that level of respect, then make sure you know I can I can do something really good for them. So I decided. I said, "Look, what do I have around me? I have the Bugatti. I have my Instagram, my YouTube, and all that sort of stuff." How can I collaborate the two together to make sure I make as much noise as possible for this fintech company? And I got paid a, a healthy amount for that. I mean, probably want more than a, one of the best footballers in the, in the Premier League will probably Good be man. paid a week. But um, alhamdulillah, all praise be to God on that side of things that, you know, this is a vision that my father had, you know, and the vision, the, the recipe is the same, whether it's a G-Wagon or a Bugatti Chiron. There's a lot of people that are probably listening to this podcast and thinking, who on earth? is going to hire a Bugatti Chiron for £25,000. Well, if there was a lot of people that did want to do it, trust me, I wouldn't have one Bugatti Chiron. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's a very niche market. And and, and, and and dare I say, it's for the big fish. <laughs> you know? Um, I listen to a lot of personal development. Part of the reason why I've started this podcast is because, as I said to you on my voice note when I first got in contact with you, is when I was young, I'm 36, Aline. What? Yeah, I'm no. 36. I'm 36. And um, I feel like a bit of a if dinosaur now. If I can look now. as good as you at 36, right? Yeah, I think Th I'll be doing well. Thanks, bro. <laughs> um, when I was younger, there was no such thing as podcasts. Um, and what I'm looking to do now is to interview go-getters, entrepreneurs, as I mentioned, to help inspire the younger demographic. But I am continuously educating myself, either listening to books or reading books or listening to great podcasts by other people. Anyway, uh, what I was getting to is, what, where I was going? Oh, yeah. So I listen to in my, I've got my own gym at my house and I, I listened to this morning, which I've listened to countless times. He's not on a podcast, but it does a lot of talks, a guy called Steve, Steve Ballmer. He took over from Bill Gates at Microsoft. He was his partner. And he's worth over a hundred million dollars, a hundred billion dollars now. Very, very successful man. I think he owns hundred like, Billy. Yeah, I think he oh owns a, uh, American football team in, in 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 America. And he said, first and foremost, when you get into business, you need to learn as an individual the art of selling and the art of presenting. Because the moment you do that, if you get a good product, if you've got a good market, if you've got a good brand, you can sell all these aspects and get people to come on board on your journey. Okay. Correct. The most natural thing I get from you when you talk, even in front of me right now and on your YouTube, on your social media, is the charisma, is the energy, is the passion, and is that, is that sales aspect. Forgetting all the cars, forgetting you know your, your father's influence and everything else, where did that come from? Was that nature or was that nurture? No, I would honestly, again, you said forget your father. This is my mom and my dad. My mom has always, my mom is a powerhouse. I don't keep her on the socials and that sort of stuff. She stays completely away from all of this sort of stuff. But if you think my dad is good, you should meet my mom. My mom was always saying to me, when a teacher wants you to talk in class, you put up your hand first. If the headmaster wants you to do a talk at assembly, you put your hand first. If somebody wants you to be taking part in a sport, you put your hand up first. She wanted me to be very, very confident in whatever I do. And I believe I owe this to her. Um, but then with that confidence, um, with, with the way that I see that my father is, that gives me... Um, even more confidence in, in, in the way that I can uh, I hold myself together. Like I can have a great conversation. I, and I, it's interesting that you say that, but is it wrong of me to say sometimes that even I know that as well, that I'm a good talker? No. Or, 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 or a good You know talker? your strengths. I seem to connect with, if I, if I like you and you're a good person, we can have a chat and I can you can really get the best out of me. 
right? But, you know, this, this does come from your upbringing. I'm an only son, right? I only have one sister. So you can imagine that they have, they've done everything and everything for me from where it was schooling, you know, taking me to some of the best schools in the country to, you know, driving me from like rugby uh, training session to another and, and, and balancing their life as well. My dad's hustle, you know, trying to establish his businesses. Like whilst I was at school and having the best time of my life and not worrying about anything out there, coming home to Alhamdulillah, such a peaceful home, peaceful settings and, and you know, your mum's food and, you know, life at home was good as well. It kind of gives you a head start into programming your brain to be very, very positive and also look for the good things look for, for look for the positives in everyone and anything you know um so again like you know coming to uh, when it comes to like for example the sales side of things hiring a car if someone sees it in a negative way why on earth would i want to spend 25 grand on a, on a big a for a day well listen mate mm. why are people paying 55 million dollars to go to space would you rather pay three million pound for a car that you're probably only going to use for like seven days of the year and have that money parked up there, or would you rather be like, listen, I want the experience, I want it for a couple of days, he's gonna hook me up with a deal, it's 35 grand, it's 40 grand for a couple of days, I'll take that. And for 40,000 pounds, you get to experience. So it's, I think these sort of things, I, I believe that there is someone out there in the world for every one of your business ideas, it's just how you can connect with them, and to connect with them, you've got to have a reasonable kind of mindset for it. But to answer your question, the confidence and the charisma comes from my mother and my father. My mum and my dad are just absolute brilliant people. You know, um, we're, we're like semi-like entertainers. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like my mom, uh, she's uh, like even her family side of the family when I go to Pakistan. Um, you know, you think what on earth like does Aleem go and do out in Pakistan? Isn't it a bit boring considering all these different countries that I've traveled to and have fun? But when you meet my family there, man, every single day is just amazing. Like they're all such characters. That's, oh, in fact, you're right. Shout out to my family out in Pakistan. In, in fact, shout out to my family here in the UK as well. My mom's side and my dad's side. Just alhamdulillah, I'm just blessed to have the type of people that I do in my life. My uncles, my cousins, my aunties. They're all just full of life, full of character and will always encourage you to do very, very well. Um, and that's what they, they do put a lot of pressure on you as well. Like if, if, if you're going half-hearted at something, trust me, they'll, they'll let you know that, listen, you're a fool. <laughs> Get jacked together. So it's, it's almost like from an outsider again, it's almost like two great worlds have come together and at the right time. I know you said about your dad had the, the, the vision and took that calculated decision and risk to invest a quarter of a million pound into a Rolls Royce and then to start the company and scale the company. But then what came later on, well, two things really, is you came to your own. You became this sort of figurehead of the brand. You became a very successful, educated. Um, I want to use the word flamboyant, but not in a negative way, just in a way where you was an entertainer. Yes. Um, very, you know. Has, well, that was had... actually my downfall, me being an entertainer, because I'll tell you something interesting. I got kicked out of both of my schools. Um, the first one wasn't so much for, okay, so I've always liked to make people smile and laugh. I mean, if I don't go into school, right, and I come away from making sure that my friends know that, you know what, it was a good day at school today. It wasn't just boring. Aleem's been like, that, that was always my go to, my thing. I was like the class clown, as they would say. Yeah. And obviously, when you go into a school where their parents are paying so much money for them to, to focus and do well, they see me as a, as a problem in, in the classroom, a distraction. Right. So it was always made very, very difficult for me to survive at that school after that point, because they pretty much in a polite way asked me to leave. They didn't kick me out. They says, could you just please leave? This yeah. isn't for you. And it was really disappointing and sad at the time because I was part of a, a county rugby team. I, I was playing really high level rugby. I had the strengths of brotherhood. Uh, with all my friends and you know leaving them was just like the hardest part ever and then when I had to move to my next school bearing in mind I went to an all-boys school first then when I went to a mixed school it was like oh my god there's girls in class now and I've got to learn how to behave around girls and it's not like you know it's just like you can't just you know say whatever you want to say you know like you would around the boys and that sort of stuff so I think that was a blessing in disguise as well I got to it got to further develop my character and prepare me for the real world 
because in the real world, it's not only just men, is it? There's women as well. And um, and this second school, uh, again, I knew that I wasn't ever going to go to university. I was going to, my father wanted me to be a pilot because I didn't know what I wanted to be. So to give you some kind of direction, they said, look, why don't you be, become a pilot, a commercial pilot? My mom was like, oh, I love, you know, dressed, nice dress, commercial pilot, walking through with these briefcase through the airport. My dad was like, yeah, you'll be a right G. You wouldn't even get checked by the security and stuff. You'd just be walking straight in and forget cars. You'll be flying planes. I was like, yeah, sound, that would be good. Anyway, ended up becoming another distraction for everyone. And then when the headmaster realized that, hold on, this kid ain't going to uni and he's only jeopardizing everybody else's chances, asking me to leave again. I was just like, I'm getting asked to leave from everywhere. At this point, my mum and dad were just like, you know, what are you what are you doing? And I was like, Dad, what, what did you not say that I wasn't gonna go to university? So I've done my GCSEs, I've done well in that. I've tried doing my A levels, they're boring as hell. I'm only thinking about getting into a plane. Can we just fast forward this whole thing and get me to a, a flying school? I've gone over to Oxford Aviation, did my hand-eye coordination test, did all the tests and that sort of stuff. And as I was walking through the school, I was looking around, I wasn't seeing many smiles. I look at everybody, it looks hella depressed. And it's like everybody's trying to force this like really happy persona on an open day. And then it started deeping, I started to deep it a little bit. And I know it was a bit deep for me to think this at 17, 18, but I thought if I become a commercial pilot, I've got to be away from home, away from my wife, a future wife, my kids, my mom, my dad, I'm an only son. I don't want to do this. I've realized straight away that, and I purposely, the second time when I went around, purposely failed the hand-eye coordination test so that I have a reason to say, oh, I can't go to this place now, mum, dad, what shall I do? So I've done that and I've come home and they're like, you failed it. I was like, yeah. And they were like, right, well, what are you gonna do now? You best realize, because he goes, you, you are gonna be, you are heading to become a bum. I was like, no, trust me, I'll be all right, I'll be all right. Because all the teachers used to say this all the time to the other kids, oh, he's got daddy's money anyway, it's fine. Like, let, you know, let him be the fool. He's got something, he, he, he's got something to go back on to. You guys need to work harder. Imagine hearing your teachers say that. Mm. How demotivating is that? Mm. So that was kind of imprinted in the back of my head as well, thinking that, oh, my dad's got some dough, I don't have to do mm. much. But then when I had no form of structure or some discipline or like a, a schedule, and I had left this flying school, the schools and everything, I was at home. I was 17, 18 years old, waking up at like 1 p.m. My mom was fuming. She was like, no way is this settling with me. She goes, you're gonna to have to get a tutor here. I need to see you in some sort of education, in some sort of structure. You can't be waking up at the time that you wanna to choose to wake up and go to sleep and look at your food. She goes, this is, this is awful. So I was hearing that for about a few weeks and it was really hurting me that I was hurting my mom. Yeah. And I got to make her proud somehow. And then I thought to myself, I was looking out my window every single day. And at the time we weren't, we didn't have the showroom. We were operating the business from my front driveway. And I had like five Rolls Royces parked on the, on the front with some Lamborghini, you know, about seven, eight cars. And I used to look out the window. I used to think, hold on a second. I love cars. I know a thing or two about making a video, or do I? I like pointing the camera at myself. I do love the camera, so hi, Lens. <laughs> but um, I thought, the park's next door. Why don't I just go and review cars? The cars I hear, people find it so difficult to get hold of these cars. I've got them on my driveway. I'm looking at them every single day. What am I doing sitting here, right, crack on with them, without even telling my dad, I did some silly stuff like donuts in the driveway, in the snow, in my Audi R8, which went viral. Um, when I say my, I've got this habit of saying my, my dad has engineered this to me because he always says, what's ever mine is your son. So, yeah. I mean, if anybody gets pissed off with me saying my, my, my all the time, you now know why. Uh, but um, so I did that in the R8. Then I used to take the Rolls Royces over into the park and review them. So you'll see some of my first reviews were with a BMW X6, were with an Audi R8, were with a Lamborghini Aventador. And I never used to tell people so much that what is it that I do and what, where these cars have come from. I wanted to keep the element of mystery there that what is this 17, 18 year old boy doing, driving around in these cars, right? And he's got access to them and he makes these videos. It was a, it was a, it was my USP, shall mm. we say? It was very easy for me to make these videos. So what I did was I I, I went with my friend um, to the local uh, electronics store, bought the cheapest camera because I'm a tight git like that. Bought the cheapest camera I could possibly find, right? Uh, with the cheapest tripod setup, went into the park next door, set it all up, and started making videos, reviewing the cars, 
And at the time, people were like saying, oh, who does this guy think he is? The next Jeremy Clark? So he thinks he's a... I was getting a lot of negative feedback from it. Obviously, I got a lot of negativity from the Lord name as well. That comes from a registration that my father owns, 1-O-R-D, Lord. So I thought I'd just name myself Lord Aleem. So I utilized this, this number plate as well. So every time I go to the car shows and events, here he is, he pulls up, big Lord Aleem, you get me? So um, <laughs> so I was like, you know what? I need to utilize that. I was actually going to call myself King Aleem and all that sort of stuff, but thank God I didn't do that. Anyway, everybody at school, which I got kicked out from, were all laughing at me and thinking, you know what? Oh, he thinks he's a Lord. What's this Lord Aleem kid doing, right? And I was getting the views, but I was also getting a lot of negative comments as well, saying, oh, mate, improve the microphone or, you know, this, that, the other, loads of stuff. And I did get demotivated at the time, but then my parents would be like, you know, carry on with it you know it's, this is what you're doing yeah this is what you're doing they weren't like all for it but they weren't all against it they were just like let him do what he needs to do now isn't it he's a bum <laughs> so i've gone and, i've gone and made these videos they've done very very well and um and 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 the rest is history if you actually go on to my youtube channel and click uh the most uh oldest videos that i've uploaded you'll be able to see what i mean uh, what, what i'm talking about here but but yeah that's how i got started and and um i got onto the youtube scene and it's a load of fun this is a perfect segue because as i was saying you know you got like almost the perfect market for the perfect individual in regards to your personality the way you come across for for this product and this market but then you had the rise of social media and looking at what you've got now you know verified on instagram got a lot of followers on over six hundred thousand, which is soon is going to be seven hundred thousand. Yeah. it's always going up yeah we're ten thousand uh, away from seven hundred yeah <laughs> then you got you know like coming up to five hundred thousand subscribers on youtube you've got millions of of hits on there and across all your social media there's millions and millions of people sort of watching you there's ups to social media and there's also downs to social media. So so before we talk about downs, let's talk about the ups. How how has social media and your following played a played a good part in you becoming an entrepreneur, becoming this household name in the car sector, the luxury car sector, and basically just business in general? Okay. Uh, so first and foremost, how has it benefited myself personally in terms of forget the business financially, me as a person? I get to meet fantastic people like yourself. Thank you. Right? I get to I get to hear about so many different industries that people are in. Yeah. I get to speak to people from all different walks of life and understanding that I can connect with them all based on one medium and that's being a good person, right? Having respect for people out there. You know, regardless of who you are, what you do, if you respect someone and you know how to extract the best out of them, you can go far, real, real far. You can turn people into superstars. You can get them making a lot of money, the money that they didn't think they could ever make themselves because nobody had, the, nobody's ever told them that you're great, right? So what it did for myself is it, it, it built my character. It made me very thick skinned as well, um, which we'll go on to the negative side in a bit. The positivities are uh, made me thick skinned, made me see people from all different walks of life. <sighs> made me kind of think that I never need, dare I say, you know, in the back of the days, it was just your friends. These are your three friends. I have my brothers who, are, who, are, who I spend most of my time with, but I consider my audience, the people that appreciate me and respect me and love me as my family, as uh, they're all my friends. Whenever I see someone out in public and they go, hey, Aleem, like, just on the way here now, shout out to, if that was your, you, just in the car, he goes, Aleem, can you give us a wave? And my mate's looking at him like, who's he? I was like, well, I don't know, but listen, that's not the way to deal with it. Or give him a dirty look. Be like, you're right, pal. And I won't remember his name, but I will ask him his name because I want him to know that at that moment of time, I wanted to know his name. It was a bit more personal than that. So, you know, it's, it, it, it teaches you also how to talk to people, how to work with people, um, how to be understanding and patient with people. Um, I think that's one of the main benefits I feel that social media has done for me, for, for myself, <laughs> for myself personally. But what it's done for my business. Have you heard that Drake, Drake song when he goes, really just lap in the race? Yeah. <laughs> it just helps you lap people, brother. It, because you imagine how much money I would probably have to fork out 
to market my company the way I needed it to be marketed. Mm -hmm. I mean, with all respect out there to all my competitors and everybody that's in the industry, you guys know how hard it is to operate in this industry. And I know sometimes you guys can be a little bit envious of the of the setup that I have and 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 the and the kind of the media powertrain that I do have. But my God, I can I can market a car as soon as it comes it takes delivery of it i don't have to phone up any car spotter or anything like that i just take a picture of that car i post it and i say it's available for hire and after that it's about having the biggest net to catch all that fish the boys have got to be ready on the on the phone lines ready to take in the bookings and that's it jobs are good and sometimes i've even purchased cars uh, sorry i've purchased cars when i haven't even, I've, I've announced them online and i haven't even purchased it yet so i'm just testing the water so i'll walk into a dealership and i'll say right i've bought this lamborghini i'll post it up because i'm like 60 percent there whether i should buy it or not and then i'll probably end up having about 20 25 people that have already booked the car there's already 50 60 000 pounds worth of work there for it why am i thinking twice buy that car right now yep push the button on it we're good to go so good, yeah and good. the negatives yeah, so I was going to get to this end. So, obviously, you know, been on a pedestal. I mean, I've had it on a very, very small level in comparison to you. I believe that when you become pretty good in your sector, so as I mentioned to you when you walked in, we're Woodbury House. We've been established since 2014. We represent a guy who's known by the New York Times as Godfather Street Art. There is nobody doing it like we're doing it. We dedicate ourselves. We're not art experts, that's first and foremost. But what we dedicate ourselves in doing is telling the story and preserving the legacy of Richard Hamilton. And I don't believe anybody else is doing it like we are doing. I agree. The downside to that is people try and bring up your past, try and bring up this, try and bring mm. up that, and say this person's this, this person's that. I've got a way of dealing with it, but I like to ask other people like you, who've got a much bigger profile than me, like, you know, people might, and I said this off air to you, about bringing up something about your dad, you know, yeah. what happened to him back in the early 90s. Or when people arson your, your cars like does it ever affect you mentally and like when people do say stuff about your father or arson your cars a few years ago how did you overcome these sort of things Aline? because yeah. i think there are entrepreneurs or even just people going to go through this journey yeah. that are not going to be expecting a curveball coming it will come yeah. and if they can listen to a conversation between two yes. two two adults here mm. And they get some lessons on how how to overcome it or, or pre prevent it. I think that's going to really serve them well. So yeah, yeah. In, in your own words, how, how do you overcome them sort of scenarios? Well, number one, I, I, I'm Muslim, so I, I have a, quite a religious background, and um, and 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 you got a strong highest, faith. Yeah, the, the highest ranked person that we see is our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and even this man, as perfect as he is, right? Yeah, was also criticised in his time. So how I see it is, you and I are not the first people to ever walk this planet, right? And and receive it. We're not going to be the last. Okay. But when you are in a position, when you're winning and you're doing well, people sometimes have a complex and they want to find a reason to kind of water down your hard work or to justify why they are not doing or why they can't do what you are doing, right? And I think that's where the hate stems from. How do you deal with it? Well, how can I stop it? Do you know, if, that, if you've already made up your mind about it, then so be it, right? Where obviously it becomes a problem, which a hundred lights never really been a problem like that. We'll talk about the arson thing because that was a little rat, right? Yeah, we'll tell you about him in a bit. But um, I've never till this day ever had someone come up to my face and talk shit to me. So what are they? Keyboard warriors? The internet gives people a safe haven to sit behind a screen and know that they won't get slapped, right? Yeah, for saying cheeky shit like that, right? Around me to my face. Right? And it's not that I'm thinking I'm a bad man, I'm far, far from it. But you know where I'm coming from? Of course. So they wouldn't have the audacity to look at yourself and say that because they know in themselves they ain't worth a pot that you're pissing. Right? If somebody is going to come and water down your hardware, your efforts, your, your gallery here, well, I'd like to see them do it. And until they're not in a position that they can do something like this, then you have no level to come. To, to to even comment on my work. Look at Cristiano Ronaldo. People still say that he's a shit footballer. How can you say that about Cristiano Ronaldo? Do you know where I'm coming from? They'll say that about Leo Messi, by the way. If you're, if you're Messi fans, if those people can also be hated on, then who on earth am I? 
Mm. Right? And I guess if they're not hating on you, or when I say hating, if they are not you know, conspiring on you and all that sort of stuff, are you really doing your job right? They want to know what you're doing. And if we tell them what we're doing, I mean, it's like a poker game, isn't it? You reveal yeah. all your cards. I want to kind of share as much as I possibly can about my business and my life on this podcast. But one thing I will never do, and trust me, I'm smart at this, is I will never tell you my direct business secrets. I will only tell you what I believe that you can also go and do. If you can work harder than me, then fair play to yourself. If you can stay up longer than me, if you've got a team better than mine, then let's go for it. Do you know, um, like you said, uh, keyboard warriors, and I'd, I've had it again a few times, but you must, at the level that you're at, get you know a bit more frequently than I me. I mean, I get told my dad is a drug dealer on a daily basis. How, 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 do you, how do you, one, deal with it at that moment in time? And then also the, the mindset, because the old saying is, enough rain wears the marble. You could be the strongest marble in the world, oh, yeah. but if the rain keeps on coming down on you, it can wear you eventually. I rate you for that question because you know what? There's one part of me that wants to be like strong because I want to kind of like give people that strength to know that if there is people out there that you're struggling with the hate, that you know you should be strong. But don't get me wrong, it does get to you. It does get to you eventually, now and again. But then who do you go to? Hmm. The people that built you your mum, your dad. And they'll sit you down, they will talk me, give me that same talk again, and instantly I'll feel better. You know, it does weather you down at times, but then again, I also believe it slows you down. So it's best just to, you know, just look straight past it. Moving on to, you know, um, forget myself. Like, you know, I get the hate that I probably do. I don't even know what I've even done wrong, but other than just just smash it in life. I'm you're like, you're but, successful, that's why. But, but my father, my father, I always say to my dad, because I did, I got asked this so many times, right? And I asked to ask my dad once, I said, dad, are you a drug dealer? And he pissed himself laughing. He goes, son, they used to call, call me a drug dealer. And when I was 17, I'm now 52 years old, 51 years old. And they're still calling me a drug dealer. He goes, I tell you what, not even drug dealers make this money. <laughs> he goes, oh, you know, I'm, I'm blessed that they water my hard work down like that. Because I'm a true believer that when a God is with you, he will support you through thick and thin. And there's many reasons why God is with someone. is how they look after their parents, what they do for others when they are making their money. Right? There's many other factors. And these are the things that... They're not shown and they will never be shown because we don't do this for the camera. We don't do this sort of stuff for the camera. You don't know what happens behind the scenes. There is only one side of the business, one side of Aleem that you see or many different sides that you see of me actually. But there is certain secrets that help you excel in life and that is when you have your mother's prayers with you, when you have your father's prayers with you, when you do, when you embed it in your head that when I make a million pound out of that million, a certain percentage is going to help people, right? When you cut that deal with God, God gives you ample. But going on to the negativity, you know, when I, when I asked my dad, dad, are you a drug dealer? And he answered that question. I see comments all the time, people saying, oh, Mr. Rick Bell's a drug dealer, this, that, and the other. My showroom is on the Coventry Road. It's one of the main roads. It's just about 10 minutes away from Birmingham Airport. There is some serious traffic flow there. I'm pretty sure some of the people that pass my showroom are probably going to be watching this podcast. If, if you are, please tell or comment on this podcast if you have ever seen my dad's office light off. He will be the first one through the door, the last one out, and maybe he doesn't even leave sometimes. He sleeps there. He doesn't have to do this anymore. I have told him time and time and time again, Dad, I got this. Yeah? That man ain't letting go. But we're a team. You know, that's his hobby. That's his passion. His work is now his passion. You know, he loves it so much. When you start to love your work, how can you not succeed in it? If you become obsessed with it, how can you not succeed in it? Mm. And then you want to question, where is all this coming from? Do you guys not understand? And, and when I say, do you guys not understand? Some, some of these kind of haters that come up with comment, comments and stuff. I have 700,000 people that follow me from all over the world. I have and my friends will vouch for this, I have gone to some of the most remotest parts of the world, and I'm no Brad Pitt or Jean-Claude Van Damme or whatever, but God's honest truth, I swear to God, I, have, I know someone in every corner of this world. I've been to so many different countries where I thought no one will know me here, and people have known me. I was walking through on a connecting flight in an airport, um, I think it was in Istanbul, Turkey, I don't think anyone would ever like, follow me from there, whatever, and one of the girls that works at the airport came running up to me, and I was like, I mean, that, that's Istanbul, Turkey, still a big country, but there's been a lot more remote mm. places than that. And I'm thinking, what? This is crazy. The internet is such a powerful place. I'm connected to people 
all over the world. What I do with those connections determines what I end up doing with my life. But on the same instance, I'm not just UK based. I'm not trying to blow smoke at my own ass, but I'm bigger than that. I am bigger than I am bigger than just this country. I'm bigger than just a city, you know? And that is the vision that I also have for Platinum Pet. So if you guys are hating on my movement right now, God forbid how you're gonna be feeling when I execute my plan, inshallah, in the next 45 years. Hmm. We'll be sitting here, Steve. Well, actually, I don't know whether we'll be sitting here. We'll probably be in a Somewhere private better. villa, yeah. enjoying ourselves, right? Kicking back, right? Sipping on a virgin mojito, virgin for me. And you'll be thinking, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> you were right, lad. Yeah, definitely. I do want to move on to, and I want to leave this kind of, uh, not necessarily painful it's part good. of the conversation. It's good to talk about it. But I want to, I want to, I want to talk about the car attack, okay? There was a, f- a few different occasions. And I think at the time, I remember seeing a an Audi R8. Mm-hmm. I think there was a Mercedes. It was actually, no, it was two Bentley Continentals, an Audi R8 and a Lamborghini Aventador or Roadster. That's it. Yeah, at a time whilst we were building our showroom. Yeah, so. this was almost at a point where you it looked like you were about to take off and, and, and you did and you have. Um, but it was it was almost seemed like the arson attack they timed it when it looked like he was just about to pop off. Yes, and the comments. So it helped the comments as well. His dad's a drug dealer. Somebody yeah. must be after him. They've burnt his car. So, so <laughs> when you first saw it, like you know, the cars are almost like your children. You know, you're looking at them like, I love these cars. I drive these cars. I'm very passionate with these cars. And then suddenly they're on fire. Mm. How did that? What was your your instant gut feeling? And then what did you do to respond to that? Yeah. Well, the first the first arson attack happened in Luton and it was in a Lamborghini Aventador so this car at the time was our most expensive car on our fleet it came at a time where we were spending money building the showroom and also buying cars so cash flow was tight and my dad and my mom and I were in London delivering a Rolls Royce Phantom drophead to a client and we got a phone call saying your car's on fire in Luton I remember my dad's my dad first went, yeah, that's fine. Don't worry, we'll, we'll come this way out. They go, no, Icky, your car's gone. He goes, it's completely toasted. And I saw a lot of worry on my dad's face at the time. My dad doesn't get worried about much, but I could tell at that time he could see that this was going to be a serious issue, especially when you're forking out 350 grand on a car. He's thinking, bollocks. We've gone over to the location. The full interior's charcoaled out. Firemen are all over the car, watering the car down. Sorry, I went away from the microphone. Watering the car down, making sure that it's all disconnected. It's completely toasted. And I, I'm not going to lie, bro, people that were there, they saw me cry. I was crying. On the side of the road, I was... 2014, how old was I? 17? 18? I was in bits. And my dad's just thinking, who on earth would do this? It must have been a problem with the customer. Gone to the customer and said, look, listen, have you got problems or something like that? No, 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 we ain't got problems. It's like, well, we ain't got a problem with anyone as well. So <clears throat> what could this be? Oh, no, we're going to get to rumours started spreading about the family that we hired the car out to. Rumours started spreading about us. Thinking, you know what? You know, it's a lot. Of, it's so annoying when you don't know who it is. And it's just come out of nowhere as well. So that was one. So anyway, the car's got recovered back. My dad's like, yeah, it is what it is. Come on, we'll come back again. I've had shit like this happen to me before. Overcome, dude. <laughs> Big deep breath. We're ready to go. 24 hours later, I'm at home. It's one o'clock in the morning. I'm asking my dad why he hasn't left the office. Where are you? He says, I'm coming home. And he hasn't come home. And his friend has phoned me and said, yo, where's your dad? I said, my dad's still at the showroom. He goes, is the showroom on fire? It was being built. Is it being on fire? I thought my dad had lit up some, a fire in the skip or something. I would never have thought that three more of my cars were about to catch fire. And I phone my dad and he goes, son, come down, show you something. So I've gone down there, gone to the Holiday Inn Hotel next door, which is where we parked the cars up around the back. It's my dad's friend's hotel. And the cars were completely toasted. My dad was just standing there. And I thought that he would be more upset now, obviously, couldn't he? But he wasn't. His eyes were just so focused. And he just thought, I I honestly, genuinely thought at that point, right, yeah, it was, it, the hood in him was about to come out. Like, it was like, fuck this business. I want heads on plates. 
you know where I'm coming from? Mm. But no rat out there would speak. Watch the CCTV back. The rats come upstairs. He's come, put some petrol oil over the tires and stuff and lit the thing up. Now, at the time, we had people working for us that started, that, you know, we were like a team. We, we, didn't, we didn't really like kind of see it like that. But we had one or two rotten eggs working for us that had conspired to start up their own car rental company and thought, imagine this same person has probably eaten from my home, fed him everything, you know, like a brother, right? And I can't say it is him, 100%, but I can tell you 99.9% .9 it's him, right? And, and everyone knows that anyway, right? So... He got what God was going to give to him. He ended up doing some bird in jail for of somewhere else. He ended up shooting someone in the blooming face as well for it. All right, yeah. But they were, you know, in Birmingham, it's like GTA. If you, they can't get because you're so strong, and they can't get what you what you have. Mm. They will do anything to get it, mm. whether that's shooting you in the face, whether that's burning your cars. And that's when I realized, hold on a second, I don't live in Warwick School, Solly Hall, little posh boy land. I live in the herd. Mm. I live in the bits. And even if I didn't live in the bits, I need to realize that anything can go when there's money on the, when you're taking bread off people's plates, being the, such a dominant company. And that's something that they can do as well. You can step it, you know, it's upsetting them. But anyway, God is great. We burnt two cars, burnt four cars, burnt two Bentley Continental GTs, a Audi R8 Spider, and a Lamborghini Aventador. And look where we are today. God's given it us back tenfold. And again, weathered me through the storm or not? Weathered my dad through that storm or not? Yes. Made us stronger? Yes. Did we still do what we needed to do? Yes. Did we do more than what we did? Yes. Did it slow us down, make us scared? No. In fact, it tightened everything else up as well. Now man's know how we operate. Life lesson, mindset lesson, business lesson. From the controversial things that you've gone through over the years with yourself, oh, by the family. way, we didn't get paid out by that for that for that fire as well. Wow. I must stress that wow. was about six hundred thousand pounds worth of damage. Didn't get paid out. All down, all down, all the, down the drain. Down the drain. Yeah. So, family, business, mindset, all that kind of stuff. What's what's the biggest lessons or lessons have you learned from controversial scenarios? What I've learned from controversial scenarios is that it's a great way to reel in a new audience when people doubt you and then you prove them wrong and and they end up starting to be your haters and then they end up becoming your lovers. And and I've been doing that time and time again. That's how I've, done, I've grown my following. They start off as haters and they turn into lovers. And whenever I get new followers as well, I do sometimes think, shall I put the story? Hi, new followers. I know how you're going to start off, but trust me, the ending's going to be beautiful. You're going to love me at the end of it. I could only sit here and do this talk here with you if I am black and white, if I am what I am. There is nobody out there that can counter me on what I say. It's all real. That's what makes my life so so much easier and makes me so approachable and, and, and makes me the person where I can connect with because it's all real. Mm. It's not like, oh, you know, like some of these YouTubers were set up something, a certain scenario for a certain thing. Everything I do is 110% real. If anything, you don't even get to see how real it is sometimes because obviously for YouTube, I like to edit my videos up with a bit of B-roll, cinematics and music and all that sort of stuff. But for those of you that have been around our workplace that know us and you know, we, I've got a fantastic team that work with me as well. Um, and they are all coming up the ranks as well and make sure that you know that they are rewarded and they, and they, and they, if they start off as a car washer, someone washing the cars and they are now, my, my, my guy that used to valet my cars and wash my cars downstairs is now my head salesman. He's, he's bringing me in a million plus a year on the, on the wow. phones and he used to wash cars. But who scouted him? Who found these sort of people was my dad. So you've got to understand, you know, with the controversy, you've got to, uh, you know, you've got to take that controversy. We love controversy. Without controversy, nobody wants to talk about you. The Blooming Daily Mail wanted to write about me saying that I won the lottery. That was a fabricated story that my dad put out there. But my dad was already 10 steps ahead of the game because he knew if I say he's a good lad, they're not going to want to report on that. Let me put something in the papers that they know that 100% they're definitely going to report on and everyone's going to want to talk about it. He's, all, he's got all the cars. He's got everything. People will believe he actually did win the lottery. So let's just put it up there. And I'm like, Dad, what have you done? He's going, oh, this is so much fun. You know? So yeah, we start off with the controversy. We turn it into positivity. And how we turn it into positivity? By just being ourselves. Keep plodding on. Keep achieving our goals. Keep smashing those targets. And we're ready to rock and rumble.
It's a really, really powerful message. When I got into sales, when I was about 19, 20 years of age, they said, whatever you go through, reframe it. So if something bad is happening to you, reframe it. And we got a mutual friend, Alfie Best, hey. but then also shout out to him and Big also his dad. Alfie. His dad said to, said to me on my podcast, he said, if it's raining, great. It means I don't have to water the, the garden. If it's sunny, great. It means I could put the roof down on the car. And what he said in a roundabout way is reframe any scenario to use it for you rather than against you and that you're the epitome of that i want to go on to and can i just say by the way mr alfie best senior legendary man i could sit and listen to him talk guy. for hours and uh, i became friends with alfie best and he's actually one of my best friends i love him to absolute pieces legendary human and his father you know he's the reason again you know if you know the son's like that you can just imagine what the father's like and my dad and him are like very good friends now so you know Birds of the same feathers flock together. Absolutely. They're super, super human beings, just like yourself. Yeah, but he's a billionaire. <laughs> My dad's not yet. <laughs> um, so you mentioned about your, your, your name, or you, let's call it uh, your, your social stage media name. name, stage name, the, the persona, Lord Aline. Right. There must be some people or organisations when you go somewhere, especially with your number plate, Lord Aline, they must actually treat you like a lord they they yeah they they, uh, they I mean, they, 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 it, they must think you are a lord so how, how how what's that feeling like what's that scenario like incredible well where it actually sealed it was i actually got invited to the house <laughs> of lords bearing in mind <laughs> i'm a self-styled lord as the daily mail would like to put it i got invited to the house of lords my awards still at home and i won an award by an actual lord <laughs> Lord Nazir, who awarded me for the contribution that I've done. And it was nice. It's nice to get awards like that. But I didn't think much of it. I've always believed to myself that, you know, whether, you know, what is a lord? You know, it's just an aristocrat. It's somebody in a position of high power. I'm not really that. But it's the, it's, it's the way that, you know, uh, you articulate yourself, the way you speak, the people that you hang around with, the things that you like, i.e. watches, art, that sort of stuff. That's a lord's thing to do. And I love all of that sort of stuff. I love the luxury life. So as for people referring to you as lord, brother, I've got a telephone number. You know my telephone number, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's my telephone number. When I call up on that and I say, oh, I want to make a reservation for five people. Oh, who's speaking? Oh, it's Mr. Iqbal. It's Lord Ali Iqbal. They, they do not question it a second time. And when I come through as well, when I, when I take my email address, Lord Ali uh, at gmail.com, you know, you get mad perks out of it. And then nobody has dared ever ask me, are you actually a real Lord? It's incredible. I get people coming up to me in public and they will all be like, you're right, Lord Deleem, how are you? I'll be fine with that for a bit. But after I get into conversation, I know them a bit better. I would always tell them, I says, don't call me Lord Deleem after that point, please. It's just a little bit awkward and a little bit annoying. <laughs> it's nice when I don't know you for a bit or whatever. But then again, you know, there's a lot of people, I mean, in my religion as well, people start to think that I thought I was a God because Lord means, you know, God uh, and that sort of stuff. But then again, they're, you know, it's what's in your heart, isn't it? Mm. Even Mister means master. You are the master of a slave or something. You know, you know, king, prince, all that sort of stuff. You know, so again, it's all in your heart. The Lord it has benefited and helped with us so much, especially if you've got the number plate. There's only two variations of the Lord number plate. That's ten R D and one O R D. So, you know, you, you can do the maths. Of which one are you going to probably see more? I do a lot more miles. So <laughs> I'll be the official one. Um. So you got the social media, and then you have the traditional mainstream media and i've seen many different headlines of a lot of successful people including you in daily mail etc and i always laugh because i've been in you know some of these articles as well before um and i laugh because i think the headline is nothing like the body of the actual <laughs> article and it's nothing like they're describing the individual or the market the person to be so, you know, when you see certain articles written by the Daily Mail, for example, what is like the feeling? Do you ever laugh to yourself? Do you ever think, why are they still writing about me? Or do you actually like it? No, I love it. About you? I love it. I love it. I actually want, uh, they've not been writing much about me recently. Probably because I'm doing well. But uh, I need to do something bad. I need to get into uh, into the Daily Mail again uh, somehow. But um, no, I love it. Again, what we discussed earlier, controversy. I just find that as a, a blessing. Because I, I know eventually, you know the the, the truth shines, and um, and 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 they will be turned into lovers. They will be turned into fans. Well, they will be, well, I say fans. They will be inspired by the drive. You know, how do you turn something like hiring cars and make it so glamorous? Mm. How do you make it so interesting? Mm. 
How do you make it so fun? Have you seen the other companies that are doing this? Oh, give me a break. I fall asleep thinking, how do you... Well, it's a bit like, and I know he's a friend of yours, um, yeah, Yanni, Yanni Myers. Yeah. He, he wrapped my, my car when I had the Lamborghini Gallardo uh, Performante and he'd done a fantastic job. And if you've got to think, like, if it was just wrapping cars, it would be boring. But right. what he's done is put a twist on it and he's made it so fucking interesting that you're kind of gripped to yeah. how he goes about presenting his work. And it's the same with thing with you. You know, hiring cars is interesting, but only so far. Then when you put a big personality on it, like you and the way you do it, it becomes a bit more of a lifestyle thing. And I think that's 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 but, the difference but between de- conventional business and your business. Dare I say it, I think Yanni took a leaf out of my book. I was doing this before Yanni. Um, when I met Yanni, I don't think he, he had about 20, 30, maybe even less than that. He probably didn't even have an Instagram account. And I called him up because I heard about this. I used to watch Fast, Furious and Something Living on, it used to be some YouTube yeah. programs. And I thought, yo, this guy's cool. He wraps these cars and stuff. Let me phone him up and tell him, and he'll be, he'll be interested in this deal. Can you wrap five Rolls Royces for me all in white? I didn't really have five Rolls Royces that I wanted to wrap in white. I just wanted to chat to him. And we just got talking from there. But then exactly what you said here, Yanomize is the perfect example of how to take your business digital and take it to the next level. That guy has an incredible work ethic, has an incredible team around him. He inspires me and inspires a lot of people. And, um, you know, I just think maybe he wished he did that a little bit younger. It's a bit difficult trying to attract an audience that's a bit younger where, and you know, time moves on and changes you. The things that I could do when I was 17, 18, 19, 20 on YouTube is not what I can do now. I haven't really got the energy to kind of up play things and be like, mm. hey guys, how's it going? And welcome mm. to another video. And today, mm. do you know what I mean? It's a bit draining sometimes. That's one of the reasons why I don't do YouTube so consistently. I like to put out pieces of work. I studied TV and film at Regents University in London, which gives me a little bit more background in like, you know, kind of adjusting the professionalism, uh, the professional side of, of of creating documentaries and creating that sort of stuff. So I like to put out pieces of work. I don't want to assign myself to putting out an episode every single week. First and foremost, um, YouTube pays well, but, you know, it doesn't pay enough for me to get excited over. You know, it can do, but that's not what I am. I'm an entrepreneur. That's why if you said to me, what do you want to refer to yourself as? Am I a YouTuber? Am I an entrepreneur? Am I a businessman? I would like to say that I'm a digital business. I'm a businessman. I'm the modern day entrepreneur, businessman who knows how to work the socials and knows how to work the real world as well. Um, and I don't like watering my brand out. If I'm always, like I haven't done many podcasts. The podcasts that I have done, I've done fantastic views inshallah just like this one will and um, the reason for that is that when you're in front of the camera too often and you're putting yourself out you water down your brand you water down your importance it's like if i'm seen in a restaurant in birmingham every other day right people just well there's a leam again but if i come around now and again all hell breaks loose you know (laughs) so um so yeah i mean again credit and shout out to all the business owners including yourself out there that are uh, social media savvy that are, are with all of that and that you know are sticking to who they are true to who they are not creating a persona not acting like they are someone else and are excelling their businesses forward um because it's it's like autopilot for you guys isn't it you just literally flick the switch be yourself your character takes you to a million and one places you get to meet some fantastic people before you know it you was doing business for x amount you met this fella he loves you to bits and now you're doing business for x amount yeah, L- lovely statement there. I want to ask you two more things. So uh, in the car sector, no doubt, I know you're always dropping hints, but other cars on the horizon for you. Right, so you see, uh, one uh, one decision we had to make was, do we spend three million pounds on a Bugatti Chiron or do we spend three million pounds buying five Lamborghini Urises, five Rolls-Royce Cullinans and five G-Wagons? But we went for the Bugatti route. Right now, a lot of people think that you know what that's probably not smart because you would have been able to make a lot of money out of the five euroses. The five you would have been ahead of the market. You would have been a monopoly in terms of the amount of cars that you have. But you see, certain things you got to do to set the benchmark, right, and really set the levels, and be pioneers in your industry, right. Really staring the ship. You know, there was a car hire company in Dubai that have got like six floors of cars, right. They've been doing it since two thousand five, and even they didn't think about the Chiron. We did it first. 
We did it a year before that. So that that's why we went down that route. Plus, it was also a statement. It was something that my father purchased because, you know, to highlight, you know, what he's achieved in life from a salesman, a car salesman, he used to buy three, 400 pound cars to now having the best car in the world. It was a magical moment, bearing in mind, I mentioned it in pretty much every freaking YouTube video I made. Mm. And I've made about 297 of them. So, um, so what, what, what is next, did you say? Yeah. Um, what is next is exactly what I said. So instead of buying another Bugatti, right? We're, I'm having some problems with Bugatti at the moment, which I can't really talk about uh, at the moment. They're refusing to sell me another car. It's nothing to do with myself personally, before anybody else, oh, they don't like Aleem anymore. They love me, of course they love me, because I drive the car everywhere. Mm. They get so much, there's, there's other issues, which maybe on another podcast I can talk to you about. I can't comment cool. m- more on that, but we'll, we'll move on to that. But it's to basically go and buy, um, just double up the fleet. I've got I've got two Rolls Royce Cullinans, two Lamborghini Auruses, two G wagons um, that are arriving in the next three to four months, um, and then it's all about placing orders. Now you know a lot of people are going into dealerships and placing orders in the hope that you know when they drive it out of there they'll get one month, two months worth of use out of it, and then quickly flip it for thirty, forty thousand pounds. That doesn't attract me, mm-hmm. you know. As I got offered three hundred thousand pounds for my Rolls Royce Dawn, which is a twenty-one plate, done twenty thousand miles the other day. I only paid two hundred seventy-five grand for it. I couldn't sell it because I had a quarter of a million pounds worth of work on it. Mm. It doesn't make sense for me. So when the dealers know that this is what you're on, they're like, "Mr. Rickbell, we want to sell you the car. You're an end user. You run this bitch into sorry, excuse my language. You run this <laughs> thing straight into the ground." Yeah, do you know what I'm saying? So um, yeah, we're just uh, we're just contacting dealers all over the country. I do most of the buying side of things, um, so I will I will kind of steer the ship in terms of. My dad didn't even know what a G wagon was when a G wagon came. He goes when I showed him the car, he was like, "Son, that looks like a Land Rover Defender. No one's going to hire that. It's too old." And that was one of the most popular cars I ever got. When you when you go into something like La Ferrari nine one eight McLaren P P one or or kind of go on par with the Bugatti, which is kind of on par Koenigsegg Pagani you know something like that I think the only car that's on par with a LaFerrari sorry with the Bugatti Chiron is a LaFerrari that's the only uh, an, an, an only other hyper car that I want I was actually trying to close a deal with um, uh, Ferrari Mayfair the other day uh, this fella who was selling his car it was uh, originally a a factory yellow car. He had it resprayed black by the official Ferrari um, uh, workshop, which is which is good. It's called Zinati. Um, or Zinassi, sorry if I've pronounced it incorrectly. Ferrari and I, we have got a we haven't got a healthy relationship because they don't like selling to car rental companies or car sales companies. Understandably, their mark and their branding is very very strong. They don't want to see it in in a car rental uh, collection. They void your warranty, so that's why you'll probably notice that I haven't got many Ferraris in my fleet. Um, we're looking to change that hopefully with an SF90 Spider, uh, and I want to get the La Ferrari. The La Ferrari has always been a dream car, but I've also started warming towards the Enzo quite a lot now. Love you that know, car. I absolutely love it. Love it's gorgeous. It. Love it. Ferrari Enzo, there's two just gone up recently for sale. There are about 2.7, 2.8 million. That is a straight investment car. But if I do get the LaFerrari, then I can run the same recipe with the uh, LaFerrari that I have run with the Bugatti Chiron. Um, but yeah, who knows where it will take us. Um, right now, I need to be focusing on um, building, trebling my, my, doubling, trebling my fleet. A lot of people think that, you know, I'm going to go into the aviation side of things. I'm going to go into the um, into the yachting industry and that sort of stuff. Um Watch this space. This is this is what I've got. Our last question on this note: um, As an entrepreneur, you're always open-minded to new things, new possibilities, connecting to new people. You must be thinking about other sectors, surely, that you're going to go into. Yeah. So, so whether it's yachts, whether it's or it could be so it could be different. It could be property, it could be recruitment, it could be art, it could be watches. What, have you ever thought about anything else? This Aline? is this, this is the benefit of self-investing, investing in yourself, right, and investing in who you are. I alhamdulillah would like to think that I'm not I'm not God's given gift that everything I touch turns into gold. I've got a lot of failed businesses that I run. You know, if we're sitting here now and thinking that, oh, everything that Aleem does is just a complete success, that's a lie, right? Out of 10 business ideas that I have, one has popped off. And that's the case with with, with majority of business people. But what, 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 sorry, what was the question again? So evolving into... In, evolving into, yes. Or different things, maybe putting your hand into different The markets. world is your oyster. When you are connected, you are so well at connecting with people. You know so many people all over the world. It's just a matter of time. You've got to di- showcase that you're disciplined in your work, in what you do. And you have nurtured this baby, which is Platinum Executive Travel, pet for short. 
and you've created and then gained the people's respect that work on a higher level than yourself, like, you know, Mr. Alfie Best Senior. And then before you know it, you can be in the property game, you can be in the art game, you can be in, in different sectors. And it's the same recipe again, but you've self-invested in yourself. Like the other day, I was with some friends of mine and um, they were with Ed Sheeran the other day. This is God's honest truth, real story. They were with Ed Sheeran in Birmingham. Ed Sheeran came to Birmingham. He was just chilling at a pub. And they were with him. He met up with a, an artist called JK. And these are, you know, Prince Nassim Hamid. Mm. Um, uh, oh, my favourite boxer. Yeah, my favourite boxer mm. too. It's his sons. They're helping me get fit at the moment. Top, top lads. We get them a YouTube uh, channel set up as well soon and all that. So maybe more. Maybe they can come onto your podcast sometime Love soon. to. Yeah. So um, these boys, they showed me a message that they got from their mother's best friend. And these boys live out in Virginia waters, you know, with the big boy house and all that mm. sort of stuff. Sunningdale. Yeah, Sunningdale, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Sim where Alfie lives. They're friends yeah, with yeah. Alfie as yeah, well, yeah. funny enough. I know the area connected. really yeah. well. His mum's best friends can't reply back to them saying that, I'm not actually jealous with you hanging out with Ed Sheeran. I'm actually jealous of the fact that you're hanging out with Lord Elite. I was <laughs> like, you know what? It's just, you know, it's comments like this that, you know, they can either inflate your head or they can humble you and make you think that, wow, I've got a sense of responsibility now that look, all different age categories, moms, women, people think I have a majority of male audience. I think 21% uh, of my audience on Instagram is a female based audience, bearing in mind, most of the time I'm posting cars and pictures of myself. So yeah, again, what can I do with it? We'll have to find out for part two. <laughs> okay, this is my last question I ask every single guest, okay? When I first got into business for myself, around about 24, 25 years of age, it was a sales company. And to get the predominantly male people working at that company, it was about 50, 60 of them, had to come up with a mantra, something they could live by every single day to keep them pumped up. Mm. The definition of a sale is a transfer of your enthusiasm. So how could I get them to live by something that kept them enthusiastic and the best version of their self? I love this and, question. And, and this is how it went. I say to them, be happy, never content. Yeah. be happy never content now I've got my own interpretation of it Aline if I were to ask Lord Aline what does be happy never content mean to you be happy never content wake up every morning consider it a blessing I know it's so cliche consider it a blessing that you're still in the game you're still healthy health is wealth at the end of the day and just go to work and leave if you do have any problems leave them all behind it's like when you head on to a football pitch or whatever, a rugby field or whatever, you're not going to be thinking about problems at home. You're thinking about the game. And what I tell all my employees, every, we have a bit of an unorthodox way. Me and my dad would like to think we're just weird, right? But that's what gets us. And, and our workers buzz off that as well. They've actually become like us. So we were just like randomly like in the office and stuff, just like, you know, whilst we're sitting down and, you know, it'll get a little bit quiet in the office and airy, like if you can hear each other, everyone's on the phones, but there's like a quick 15 minute where everyone's quiet, but there's not much sounds going. You can hear the printer going off and my dad will just do something like this. Whoa! And then like, they'll be like, yo, like our gaffer's an absolute nutcase. <laughs> Sorry if your eardrums have just burst on the microphone over there. They would just go absolutely nuts that the gaffer's on, but he's, he's, yeah, yeah. he's more charged up than anyone. If you are taking an army to war, if the general is not there and, and injecting it, who is going to infuse that enthusiasm into? Um, rewarding them when they have to be rewarded and working. And But you've got to siphon and pick your workforce as well. Sometimes you can reward someone and they can start to think too much of themselves and they don't perform like the way that they do. But what I have is I have a team that understand all the materialistic things in the world is not what I'm going to be impressed by. Or I wouldn't rate one of my workers if they had gone out and worked so hard and they'd come back to me and they'd go, I've just bought a Louis Vuitton bag. I say, don't watch me. Don't look at me. I need you and my dad mentors all of them anyway. I need you to be onto the property ladder. I need you to do certain investments. You need to stick to yourself. Build them. And they respect you. They realize, hold on a second. He's, I've got one of the brands called, I don't like losing money. This is what I tell, all, my, my, that's what my dad's saying is, but this is our kind of ethos is that, you know, stack it, stack it, get into a position where your family and yourself are happy and stable. Because then what that will do is that money isn't the form of happiness. What money does is it gives you a little bit more freedom to be happy. Options. Yeah, options. Things that you can do for your family members that you couldn't do before that means so much more. I would say to them, I said, before you think about buying yourself something, buy your someone in your family something because it will give you more happiness than anything else. And that will be your drive to do even better, right? There is, there is workers of mine that, you know, 
that are very, very skilled in what they do. And, and the reason why we all work together is because we genuinely care about each other. I won't go a lot, you know, I, I, share, look, I can come into work with a new watch worth 200 grand, right? And I can be comfortable knowing that I'm gonna show my worker this watch. And he's not like the average worker where he'll be like, oh, Gaff has just bought one of them watch, he doesn't pay us enough, right? Oh, I want one of them, no. They have no spite or jealousy in them because we've eliminated that form. That's how my father is and that's what he's trying. This is all credit to my dad. He's kind of set up these boys for me and I consider them brothers. I'll ride and die for these guys. They're like my family. This is my pet team. May God bless them always. And if they're listening to this, you know, thank you so much for all the hard work that you guys do. And, um, and I'm looking forward to the season that we have in hand. Um, it's after Ramadan, the season kicks off and we've got six months worth of graft and we've got targets that we've got to meet and we meet them targets. It's going to be party time, baby. <laughs> Wicked. Lord Alim, thank you so much. Thank you so, thank much, you so much. Thank you for thank the you. time. It's been an absolute honour. I'm very, very humbled that you're coming to the podcast, bro. Um, I'm very much looking to forward to your journey over the next six, 12 months, five years, 10 years. Hopefully we could do a couple more of these. I definitely want to come up to your... Uh, uh, headquarters and do a second part um, if you enjoyed this episode please subscribe comment share all that all that great stuff you obviously know who this guy is but if you don't please follow him and always remember to be happy never content yes. nice one thank, thank you, you so much Cheers. Cheers.